From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Alexis, codenamed Doc Holiday Jackson. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. It's our weekly listener mail segment, and uh, we have to admit, we've been getting a lot of strange stuff. I don't know about you all, but I... I love these, and I'm I'm especially fond of the clarifications and corrections we get because it helps keep the show honest. So thanks to everybody who wrote in to us about uh, anarchy and about uh, the origin of skinheads. And thanks also, oh my gosh, to the three people who wrote in to us today. There's some amazing things here, and there's another thing that has me honestly quite concerned. Ben, I'm sorry. I didn't see those uh, emails. What did we get wrong about the origins of skinheads and anarchy? Uh, on the anarchy front, you know, uh, we were largely being humorous with the idea that some people just want to watch the world burn. Uh, obviously, that is not the case for all anarchists who have various different aims and motivations uh, and, you know, may be advocating for a peaceful transition to anarchy. Uh, and then in the ter- in terms of skinheads, I thought I had said this on air, but it, uh, s- skinheads get conflated with neo-Nazis because they kind of co-opted that movement or that uh, aesthetic in the 1970s, I want to say. And before then, you know, skinheads were working class people associated with, you know, two-tone culture and stuff like that. Oh, I'm almost positive we said that on the show and clarified that. I think I sort of got it wrong, and then you chimed in and clarified the actual origin of the skinhead movement and how it was co-opted into that uh, kind of more what it's associated with now, which is that neo-Nazi aesthetic. Because we were also talking about sharps and the idea of skinheads against racial prejudice and all that. I remember this. Yeah. And also, switching gears here, shout out to the specialist, let's call him, uh, who wrote in about the Kursk submarine episode. Gave us some amazing insight from somebody who really understands that kind of situation and maybe had some knowledge. Shout out to you, unnamed person. (laughs) We may have to bring that up in a later episode. And that's what we're doing all day today, celebrating you, the most important part of this show. So we're going to get right into it with our first message from someone we're going to call Schmidt. Hey, I listen to you guys' show a lot. My name is Lachlan Schmidt. I listened to one of your previous episodes in the last year about UFO crash in the 1960s in off the coast of Nova Scotia. And I wondered if you guys had heard about the Jackfish First Nation UFO crash that happened here in Canada. Our government quickly covered it up, which is kind of crazy because they happened to be on uh, uh, indigenous land when it happened and they kicked out the media and wouldn't allow the indigenous elders to come and look. And they said it was some sort of military test for new gear, but we don't develop our own planes in Canada. So I highly doubt that. Uh, I thought you guys might be interested and have a nice day. Well, 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 an unidentified flying vehicle that crashed on first nation soil in Manitoba Whoa, this sounds amazing. It's right up our alley. It's exactly the kind of thing we want to look into. And guess what? I did some looking into this. Oh, good. I did do the research. However, Schmidt and everyone else listening, I couldn't find the specific thing that Schmidt was talking about here. Jackfish, First Nation, UFO crash, 2010, 2011. I did find, however, a very interesting UFO crash or possible UFO crash that occurred in a very similar area, or very close at least, in 2015. And we found an article here from Mysterious Universe. Not always the best source, but a a great place to find stories like this. The title is UFO Crash Reported in Manitoba Denied by Canadian Forces. 
So let's just talk about what happened here. In Jack Head Reservation in Manitoba, Canada, not Jack Fish, as Schmidt pointed out, there was a possible UFO crash into Lake Winnipeg. And it's crazy. In this article, you can see images of trucks and police vehicles showing up to the place where this UFO crashed into the lake there. You can hear stories about people who were there who witnessed the aftermath. And there are a few witnesses who say they saw something enter the lake. This is what they say they saw. A, quote, large disc that crashed into the lake that was then pulled out by these military and police authorities. Whoa. Whoa. Can you imagine witnessing that? A disc-shaped craft entering Lake Winnipeg, and then later that same disc-shaped object being pulled out by authorities. It feels like an episode of X-Files. Yeah, or an episode of stuff they don't want you to know. I mean, <laughs> this is, it, it's, it's interesting because typically in reports of unidentified flying aircraft or unidentified aerial phenomenon, unidentified flying objects, whatever you want to call them, in most reports, they are seen once, right? They're seen going by or hovering in the air. Uh, they're rarely seen, you know, crashing and then getting pulled back out. Schmidt, you raise a fantastic point here in your message to us. It is true. Canada has the ability to license some jets, like fighter jets, for instance, if we're talking about military craft. But I don't think they have the budget to domestically create a lot of military craft. This also reminds me a little bit of the story of the Avro Arrow, uh, which might be a story for a different day. But I don't know. It seems completely reasonable that suppressed military technology would be confused with a UFO. I mean, it is a UFO. Yes, absolutely. And we talked about that numerous times on this show, the similarity between unacknowledged aircraft and unacknowledged operations of aircraft by militaries and how that gets confused with, you know, an extraterrestrial vehicle of some sort all the time and sometimes on purpose. So, so that the waters get a little muddied about what the military is actually testing. I would say that Canadian forces do work closely with U.S. forces when it comes to aircraft and aerial intelligence and training and testing of aircraft. So that's a possibility there. Let's jump to a Wednesday, February 18th report that was posted on Facebook by someone named Brent. This comes from that Mysterious Universe article. Here's the Facebook post. UFO crash reported on the Jackhead Reserve in Manitoba, Canada. Apparently, the Canadian military have vehicles lined up on North Shore. They are threatening anybody who tries to take pictures. Lots of eyewitnesses. There's a round object being hauled across the lake, being pulled by snowmobiles and a bombardier. Something was seen going down by eight fishermen. They reported it. Why would they not let the media know if it was a plane crash? Hmm. There was also another report on social media. That, again, this is coming from social media. It is not verified news, right? It's not corroborated, but here is what it was stated. Apparently, a disc-shaped craft was seen crashing through the ice on the lake at least one person got photographic evidence but has since been detained by the Canadian military. <gasps> Interesting. So it's very men in black, right? Yeah. You know, you have to wonder about how mundane the story might be. One thing that's interesting in a lot of uh, events that later turn out to be cover-ups by a military or by a government is sometimes the motivation for the cover-up seems like it wouldn't be that big of a deal to, you know, someone who's not in the government. Like, hey, just say that you were testing a new kind of uh, vertical takeoff device mm -hmm. and that you still have more testing to do. That, that should be fine instead of making us think <laughs> there's this enormous conspiracy using outdated extraterrestrial technology that landed in prehistoric times. You know what I mean? But we have to remember that inside that bubble, of military testing, there are valid concerns. The last thing they want 
is a geopolitical rival, knowing exactly where they are on a development timeline. Even if they're ahead, even if they're behind, you want to have that kind of fog of war. You want to obscure your progress. You know, it's funny, we, we had a little off mic discussion about the distinction between Jack Head and Jack Fish. And I actually found an article for a region of Canada called Prince Albert. It's a website called PA Now, Prince Albert uh, Now, and it says Saskatchewan UFO reports in 2018 include Jackfish Lake uh, and Prince Albert, and it's just talking about specifically a sighting on June 29th, 2018. I'm sorry, I, I said 2008, I mentioned 2018, um, near this body of water called Jackfish Lake. Um, the sighters reported having, quote, uh, sp- dreams and spiritual attacks. Then on July 5th, there was another report in the area uh, of someone seeing a silver orb um, hovering in the sky, much like you were describing, Matt, near uh, Jackfish Lake around 1045 in the morning. Point being is that the crux of this article is that that this area uh, has... Uh, been kind of a hotspot for UFO sightings. And in Canada in particular, in 2018, um, there were over 900 UFO sightings. Um, and that was published in a report from UFO ufology uh, research, which is a group in Manitoba that publishes, you know, data surrounding UFO sightings in the region. Um, and, you know, while similarly to, to these kinds of reports here, some of them are more difficult to explain. Uh, many of them are easily dismissed as just, you know, sightings of lights in the sky, star-like objects or distant lights, etc. But the classic kind of flying saucer disc-shaped craft was only present in 24 of those reports. Uh, and that this uh, article suggests that uh, perhaps the classic model is, is not in vogue anymore. Um, which is interesting. But yeah, I mean, um, it's pretty interesting too the way this report categorizes the sightings. It has a quote strangeness factor <laughs> graded from one to nine. Um, and the average strangeness factor in the 2018 report was a 4.4. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's certainly become kind of a hotbed of this kind of um, this kind of stuff to the point where even some kind of UFO enthusiasts are coming to the area to kind of try to have sightings of their own. And for more information on that report, uh, check out our earlier episodes on the Shack Harbor incident. Check out also, can you become a ufologist? Mm-hmm. That ufology episode especially will explain Uh, why we see a preponderance of ratings or metrics like strangeness factor. Yep. Check it out. Saskatchewan, man. There's all kinds of stuff going on in the skies over there. They ought to call it Sasquatchistan. Oh, wow. Sasquatchuan. Never mind. Uh, Hey, if you're in Saskatchewan, you're in any of these areas, and you've seen something, maybe in Manitoba, Jackfish, Jackhead, make sure you call us or write to us, just like Schmidt did. Hey, before we we move on, we got to let you know that there is an official response to what occurred, or a retort, maybe, from the Canadian forces, the military there. So uh, we've got a report here from CBC. It's Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, maybe, or company. You you know what it is if you're Canadian. It's the CBC. So... um, The Canadian forces responded and said on Wednesday night, several people say they saw a bright light in the sky, that there was some kind of UFO. The rumors became stronger when photos were posted of the actual Canadian forces, uh, all those vehicles in the area that we mentioned on that Facebook post, and people were claiming there was a UFO, it was a crash site. But according to Lieutenant Colonel Paul Davies, it was not a UFO at all. He says it was an Arctic response company group training exercise that occurred on Lake Winnipeg. He said, quote, there's no aliens, just my friends in the Air Force who are out there helping us on this exercise. I have the commander of that Air Force contingent sitting right beside me, and you know, he assures us that that was not a UFO, but that was him. I think that's a very conversational approach, and I enjoyed hearing it that way. He also goes on to say that the bright light people reported did occur, 
but that it came from an airplane that just takes off very quickly. And he says, from a distance, it may have looked like it was going straight up in the air, but it was not. It was just us out there playing our games. Uh, Uh, Again, I love the conversational tone. And that's why I mentioned vertical takeoff craft, because, you know, those those do exist, right? Um, Oh, yeah, vertical takeoff and landing. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) you have to land the plane. So it seems like there's an explanation, but without more detail, of course, people are going to insist that the Arctic Response Company group was up to something nefarious. Yeah, uh, and just this is a little more from the article. It says around 150 military personnel took part in that exercise they called Exercise Arctic Bison. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Mm-hmm. Exercise Arctic Bison 2015. Remember, this occurred in 2015. Um, And there were several groups involved, 38th Canadian Brigade Group, 2nd Battalion of the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, the 4th Canadian Ranger Patrol Group, and the 440th Squadron of the Royal Canadian Air Force. (sighs) Lots of groups involved in a big old exercise. Reminds me of, uh, what was that one, Ben? It's an exercise in the U.S. around 2015 that we were looking at. Jade Helm. Jade Helm. Mm. <laughs> yes, we do need to do an update on that. Uh, also, before we move on, I feel like it's very important for us to state these sorts of exercises happen pretty constantly. And if you think about it across the globe, if you look at the training exercises, you look at the war games, as they're sometimes called, the field experiments and so on, there is a ton of activity out there. and. Honestly, in the U.S., we don't hear about a lot of it. We don't hear a lot about, you know, uh, technological experiments happening in other parts of the world, right? No, we don't. But we like to hear about it. So if you're in the know, again, give us a call. Write us an email. Do what you got to do. We received an anonymous email very recently that was encrypted both ways, super secure for the sender. And... I haven't even opened it what yet. What happened with that, you guys? There was a little back and forth, and we all were a little freaked out by this whole thing. <laughs> well, it we maybe should be, but at the same time, it's great. Uh, we're we're going to open that email, take a look at it. Anybody who wants to send us things securely, there are ways to do it. Check it out online, and then send us anything you want, especially if it's a little sensitive. We're interested. And speaking of that correspondence and anonymity, That's a pretty good segue into our next story, which we'll explore after a word from our sponsor. And we are back to shake things up a little bit. We're going to explore an email next. This email is from someone who has chosen to identify themselves as Jace. Here is what Jace says. Just listen to the episode that had both the pseudo side and the guy that was using such an elaborate disguise to steal money out of those casinos. You can call me Jace. I'm a big fan of your show. Over a decade ago, I made a stupid decision to rob a bank and had to go on the run. I thought of faking my own death, but did not have the time or resources to do so. Instead, Jace says, I went on the run to a different part of the country and began using an alias and posing as being from a different country, using an accent from that country as well. Well done, Jace. I would love to hear it. Jace continues saying, I was able to get a fake ID saying I was from that country and with my new name to start my life over. It was surprisingly scary how easy it was to do this physically, especially with the FBI and other law enforcement agencies scouring the U.S. for me. Mentally, however, it was incredibly arduous. There's the stress of always looking over your shoulder. One of the hardest parts of leaving was severing all ties with loved ones. It pained me terribly and my family as well. I was on the run for almost a year when by a strange stroke of coincidence, I ran into some old family friends from my original life in a theme park, states away from where they lived. Being friends of the family, they obviously knew I was wanted for the bank robbery. The authorities were notified. I was given five years and have since done the time, paid the money back, completed probation with no problem. Congratulations, Jace. And am now in the process of writing a book based on the true events. Keep up the great work you guys do. 
Keep us updated on the Pentagon's UFO situation. We appreciate you, Jace. Uh, Jace also, first off, this is an email, right? And just like a voicemail or an email, it's tough to verify sources. Jace did provide some proof. I did a little bit of uh, due diligence, and this looks legit. I don't know if you guys saw the proof that Jace provided. Yeah, the image, what looks like a lineup. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Really, really interesting stuff here, Jace. Thanks for listening and telling us about what what you did. Um, Honestly, I want more. I want the book. Let's read the book. Make sure you're getting on that, Jace. <laughs> I thought this would be interesting to share on air because it's one of our first firsthand experience responses regarding the idea of getting off the grid or, you know, starting your life anew. And it sounds like this just makes me convinced, again, not to visit theme parks, even pre-COVID, right? <laughs> I, I, I think you might get identified. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look. Theme parks are not for everybody, but they're great fun if they're your thing. It it made me start thinking about our earlier conversations regarding how to actually disappear. And I've got to say, Jace, I'm quite surprised that uh, you were able to make it for so long with getting that identification. I would want to know specifically what kind of ID, you know, what kind of uh, paperwork you were able to obtain. Uh, You know, another thing for anybody trying to get off the grid uh, in the age of the pandemic, it's going to be much more difficult because so few people are accepting cash, right? You have to use a card of some sort often. Yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, honestly, um, I I had a situation recently where I left my wallet at home uh, after traveling kind of far to to go to a store to, to buy some stuff for my kid. There's this store that she really likes called Five Below, and it's like they sell like anime crap and stuff. And I realized I didn't have my wallet, and at first I was like, God, that sucks. I don't have any cash. I don't have my cards. I don't have anything. And then I realized everyone takes uh, Apple Pay now. Everyone. Like Ace Hardware took Apple Pay. This Five Below Below store took Apple Pay, and I had it all set up, so I was good to go. But it just goes to show, like that's it. Not even cashless. We're even heading more towards like cardless. You know, uh, mm. it's pretty pretty wild. You know, speaking of cardless, I am very interested in the process Jace took to get that fake ID. Because it, um, it sounds like he went through official channels. At least that's the way I'm reading it. What do you what do you take from that, Ben? Well, it's look, I want to be very clear. I am not I am not a person who feels like there's a lot of voter ID fraud or anything like that. Doing the cost benefit analysis of it, it's it's just too much trouble to to do it in a way that would swing the needle in a vote. But if you're getting a new ID, Depending on the state, depending on the form of identification, it's not as it's not impossible. It's not as tough as you would think, you know, as a matter of fact, in some parts of the world, uh, in some parts of the U.S., it is probably easier to get a, a fake ID than it is to get a copy of some of your legit stuff. Like, have you ever tried to replace a social security card when you don't Nightmare. already also also have uh, an original copy of your birth certificate? Mm-hmm. Get that stuff notarized. Like, anytime you have a background check, the, there's a bunch of stuff you have to try to get, and the system can grind on so slowly. So maybe there's someone listening out there who just got a fake ID because it was faster <laughs> and easier to be like, you know... Um, Max Powers, astronaut with a secret or whatever. I was looking at this and and thinking about the order of operation. So I don't know how Jace, I don't know how Jace did it. But one of the one of the first things that you would have to do is is prepare a great deal. And I think some people fumble the ball when they start preparing, right? Like it's you you should tamp down, and then disappear your social media as much as possible. You should brick that. You should start to distance yourself from regularly expected communications, things like that. Uh, But you should not be preparing through the use of your internet browser. 
Honestly, if you're really planning to disappear for uh, um, a compelling personal reason or because you are on the lam, they're going to find your search history. They're going to be like, oh, this guy spent, you know, eight to 12 months obsessively searching how to get off the grid in various means. He's on some forums that we already had our eye on. We don't think he's dead. Yeah, I don't want to tell people how to disappear if they're doing it for bad reasons. If you're doing it for good reasons, uh, maybe check back on an older episode that you've downloaded and hear perhaps uh, an ad about a VPN service that we've talked about previously. <laughs> Start doing that kind of thing if you have to do internet searches. But definitely don't use said VPN service to watch Netflix from other countries because that is not cool, guys. <sighs> so... There's there's one other uh, one other thing that I thought would be of interest to you, Jace, and then also of interest to our fellow listeners, which is yes, the system exists. Statewide surveillance, nationwide surveillance is a thing. It's a thing for a reason, but it is not yet as comprehensive as you might think. It has the potential to be comprehensive. And if you become a person of interest, a suspect, an arguido, then you may get the spotlight shined upon you, and that spotlight will go very deep. But you might be surprised to learn how many people in the U.S. are existing in a liminal space between the mainstream social financial world and the uh, off the grid or under the radar life. Like even here in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, some areas in the latest census were found to have over 40% of the residents living as unbanked. That word kind of, it means what you think it means. It's people who do not participate in the banking system. So you're paid in cash, kind of existing cash. Uh, you may have, you may have government assistance. So you're on the grid that way, but you're not that government insistence is not going to a checking account because you do not have one. Some people out of choice, some people because of dire financial straits. If you really want to disappear, you have to start erasing the footprints you've already created. And they're, they go back a long, 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 long way. Yeah, we, we, we know even people like with lots of money and resources and contacts it's very difficult to scrub that stuff from the internet, you know, or from, from any record of note. Very difficult. You know, we hear all the time about celebrities not liking certain pictures of themselves. And the internet has a way of remembering, you know, even if you get it all off. It's like that Hydra uh, situation that you're always describing, Ben. When you cut off one head, it grows back three more or whatever, you know? Yeah, there, there are some interest. It's just, okay, let's think of it as a thought experiment. There are some interesting things. And Jace, uh, Jace did extraordinarily well. This is a difficult thing to do as a serious pursuit. Uh, but you can, you can read a lot of, I don't know, I would say armchair advice on some of this stuff. It's not the same thing as hearing from someone who has firsthand experience. Uh, we know the basics uh, and I, I think you're right, Matt. We do talk about it in a previous episode, so don't have to explore it too much. But there is – I wonder if there's anyone who just decided to start over without a compelling reason. Like they were not being pursued by law enforcement or persecuted by government. They were not in a dangerous, violent, personal relationship. They just woke up one day and said, you know what? I'm going to go by Rupert now. I'm going to drive to Manitoba. I'm going to go by the name Rupert. P surname, and I'm going to work at a factory. Because if you live a modest enough existence and you don't have like a heavy crime on you, you don't have a wealthy family, then probably like after one to three years, they'll just consider that they'll just think you disappeared in the woods because naturally you told a bunch of friends that you were going camping and would be back in two weeks just to give you that margin of time, right? Yeah, and and you left a canteen and one of your shirts that was you know worn for like two or three days in a row had your scent on it, so the dogs can find it. You went out in the woods. You've left all that stuff there. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> By the way, I would pronounce it Suriname or Suriname, just just to make sure people don't catch on that your last name is surname. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> right, right. Like Dr. Alucard in yeah. every TV series, miniseries about vampires. <laughs> uh, I loved your drop of Arguidos there, by the way, Ben. I caught that. That was very good. We're slowly doing a terrible job learning Portuguese. <laughs> but we have, uh, we have one more piece of mail uh, that also, slight foreshadowing, has a Rupert involved. What are we talking about? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. And we're back. And the Rupert in question uh, for this segment of Listener Mail is one Rupert Sheldrake, a, a very fascinating figure, a scientist, uh, British biologist who um, has put forth some very interesting theories uh, that have often been considered by some critics in the scientific community to be pseudoscience, uh, but absolutely something that uh, has some resonance for many others. Uh, and this one comes from an anonymous listener uh, calling in from the road. Hey, greetings and salutations. <laughs> Truckers love uh, uh, stuff they don't want you to know. <laughs> Truckers also love um, stuff you should know. And I was just listening to an episode of that. I'm sure you guys are all bosom buddies, right? Wink, wink. <laughs> On morphic resonance, eating a sufficient quantity of psilocybin might lead you to look into that a little deeper. Don't eat the Liberty Caps, a different kind of much more toxic poison in those mushrooms. But if you eat the Striphelia cubensis, um, even in microdoses, you might understand what he's talking about. I'm not saying there's any, you know, scientific evidence for the morphic resonance, but the psilocybin will let you know there's a lot more out there. We're all in tune somehow. It's like the energy waves, bro. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> 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 oh my god! Love that, it. That lit up my my <laughs> my, my day. Uh, the the ending sound effects in particular. He gave us he gave us a honk, man. He gave us a honk. That's like the growing up. That's one of the coolest road wise cosines you can get. So uh, thank you, Anon, and ha ha to you. <laughs> yes, and uh, bosom buddies. <laughs> What was that? Was that a reference to something? I don't know. What is? Uh, He's just saying we're pals with with Josh with, and Chuck. With J and C. Yep. Yeah, that, it's true. It's true. We are. Um, but yeah, like I said, the, this is referencing something that stuff you should know did an episode on uh, recently called morphic resonance or the study of morphic fields. And this is a uh, a, st- a field of study um, that it was was pioneered by this gentleman named Rupert Sheldrake. And he is he's very much still alive. There's a TED talk from him that you can see. Um, he was educated at Cambridge University. He earned a doctorate in biochemistry there in 1967. He has been a fellow and director of studies in biochemistry and cell biology uh, at Cambridge as well. And much like the interview we did with uh, Russell Targ, you know, who is absolutely an MIT um, bona fide scientist, he decided that the realm of study that he was more interested in was one that maybe was considered by the scientific community at large to be one not necessarily worth exploring. Uh, things like psychic abilities or um, this concept of uh, morphic resonance, which really just refers to sort of the interconnectivity between between life forms. Um, so, for example, like the the notion that I could feel you, Ben, or you, Matt, if you were staring at me really hard or if you were thinking really hard about me or um, uh, it explains, attempts to explain the phenomenon uh, behind how dogs are interconnected with their masters and things like that. Our caller brought up the idea of how this phenomenon, if it's a thing, could be enhanced by taking psychedelic mushrooms, which, you know, we, we actually just talked about in our uh, previous Strange News episode about how this is something that's being used to kind of breed connectivity between people and, like, the idea of, you know, end-of-life experiences and, and passing on to the other side or however you want to look at it. Religion or spirituality don't have to enter into it at all. But, yeah, this guy, um, uh, Sheldrake, has been 
much maligned uh, by uh, others in the field. Uh, for example, um, one particular critic, uh, John Maddox, who is the editor of Nature, uh, the journal Nature, referred to Sheldrake's ideas as, quote, heresy and said that they deserved to be condemned. Hmm. Uh, disagree. Disagree. I'm going back in here because I have, I feel like I've experienced morphic resonance. Maybe that's why this whole thing exists because it sometimes you feel like it, but it may also exist because there's something to it. And to connect that world with our fungal friends over here, the uh, psilocybin, the magic mushrooms, I just wanted to bring up something with you guys that I know we've talked about a little bit before. But thinking about the interconnectivity of a mycelial network and the way communication occurs, the mm. distances that it can travel, um, just with information passing underground, unseen by anyone else, just traveling across um, where one area of uh, the network, like we're talking miles and miles away, knows what's happening or gets a signal about what's happening from the other side. It's like, an information superhighway. It's it a is fungal internet, essentially. Yes. That's how it works. It's not hyperbole. And they're everywhere, everywhere below our feet. Mycelial networks exist. And, you know, our brains are doing the same thing. We've got these very, very uh, specialized feelers and senses that are able to experience the world externally. But ultimately, it's it's our own, you know, network up in that cranium of ours that is sending very similar signals to the mycelial network and experiencing uh, externally in a lot of ways that, that they do too. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I I'm getting it. at here. I, I just, I see it. There's some connection here between the network, the mushroom, and then the way humans brains function and then interact with one another. Right. Well, the brain itself is just a network of cells communicating with each other through electrochemical means. So it, the process, of course, the process is different. I think what one important distinction of what Sheldrake proposes is that there is not necessarily a physical connection necessitated. So the mycelial networks do have physical connection. So the idea here then is that uh, all organisms, all things that we understand as living are connected in a way that does not necessitate a physical medium and that this connection uh, can be a two-way process similar to, um, I mean, let's say the T word. It's, it's a kind of idea of telepathy. And, you know, maybe, maybe it sounds crazy because there isn't 100% accepted proof of telepathy, but I would also say we're still learning a lot about plants. Like, we just kind of figured out that plants talk to each other. Some of them scream when they die. Right. You know, like, more humans are not as unique as we think. Um. I completely agree. And there's a really cool blog post on Scientific American by uh, someone named John Horgan, who himself is a, is a, is a science writer. And he presented at a, an event or some kind of conference with Sheldrake and while was kind of skeptical of him in interacting with him personally, really kind of gave his work a second look and a second thought. And he um, had some really interesting things to say about their shared uh, fast. I don't know, their, their shared philosophy, I guess, on the types of research uh, that Sheldrake does. Um, uh, he described their mindset uh, as this. And um, the, the writer of this blog post wrote a book called The End of Science. Um, and he says, we both, this is Sheldrake speaking of him and Corgan's kind of shared philosophy. We both agree that science is at present limited by assumptions that restrict inquiry. And we agree that there are major unsolved problems about consciousness, cosmology, and other areas of science. I am proposing testable hypotheses that could take us forward and open up new frontiers of scientific inquiry. I think that's 
spot on. I mean, we don't know how the brain works exactly. We, we, we know how the brain works as an organ, sort of, but we don't know how consciousness works. We don't know what it is, this, this oneness that makes us a human being, you know, with, with feelings, and we don't understand any of that stuff. So the idea that that stuff isn't worth studying seems so short-sighted to me, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think oftentimes when people, when people say skepticism is the default position, they're conflating that with a refusal to investigate something, right? Critical thinking demands that you actually get in the weeds about stuff. Maybe that's not the best uh, turn of phrase to use since I basically said I, I, I think plants might have some sort of weird consciousness. But so there's another Scientific American post by uh, Michael Shermer, publisher of Skeptic.com. And he also wrote a book called The Science of Good and Evil. And he has an interesting note about morphic resonance. Of course, he's coming from a very, very skeptical place. But he has an interchange with Sheldrake about the folks who dismiss the existence or the proposed existence of the morphic field. And I wanted to read this. I wanted to get you guys' take. So after laying out all the problems skeptics would have with the concept of morphic field and the way it's been tested in the past, Sheldrake responds that skeptics dampen the morphic field themselves, mm. whereas believers enhance it. And he said about one skeptic, he said, quote, perhaps his negative expectations consciously or unconsciously influence the way he looked at the subjects. So maybe... It's difficult because then that makes it difficult to disprove or prove anything. It worked because I believed in it or it didn't work because you didn't believe in it. Not because it's not real. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, yeah. You, you hear that. I don't want to say excuse, but that reasoning behind a lot of magic, magic thinking things where uh, even something as simple as a Ouija board. If you, if you believe, then it's going to happen. <laughs> Um, I don't know. It feels like the double slit experiment a bit with particle physics. Mm -hmm. It also it also feels like uh, a bit of the other mind over matter conversations we've had in the past. We know mental state is a critical piece of recovery from grievous injury, right? We know that the state of your mind affects your body in real, quantitative, and predictable at times ways. Uh, but but to your point, Noel, it doesn't, it, yeah, it does seem like whether, whether or not people feel they can easily, easily dismiss this, it does seem short-sighted to say, we assume we can dismiss this, therefore we shall not consider it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's very head in the sand. Well, it also would discount so much scientific innovation and folks that, you know, questioned whether the earth was flat. That was a radical idea at the time, you know, and now, uh, I mean, obviously there's still a handful of folks that think that, but uh, largely we've pushed past that and, and uh, that's helped inform a lot of other uh, things that we know and understand about the universe and about, and about the planet and about, you know, humankind. So if the person, if, if there was never that person that made that push and was like, no, you know what, I don't care what the, the, you know, the status quo says, I'm going to keep pushing. And I think that's what this Sheldrake guy is. And again, also that Russell Targ, uh, which is one of my favorite interviews we've ever done, um, talking about his uh, book, uh, Third Eye Spies and the, the CIA program of remote viewing that he was instrumental in. And I swear to God, he had to have been the guy that Egon Spangler in Ghostbusters was based on. Looks just like him and has the similar kind of vibes. Um, but, you know, uh, it, people get called a quack until they're called, you know, genius. I think we should remember, too, that the... Evolution of science, what a cutesy phrase there, is riddled with stories of scientists being criticized, defamed, hunted, tortured, killed because they wanted to investigate something that they were either, one, not allowed to investigate, or uh, they found something in their investigation that they were not allowed to prove. Never forget this same species, not too long ago, killed the guy who figured out that you can save lives by washing your hands. Ignaz Semmelweis, he just said, hey, maybe, you know, not even everybody, don't everybody wash your hands. If you're a doctor and you're going to do surgery, 
then wash your hands. And people treated that like it was crazy. They literally put him in his in an insane asylum and beat the snot out of him, and he died there. Totally. Or even what we talked about the other day um, on an episode that may or may not be out yet. Uh, you know, how the government can, you know, redact a patent, you know, if they think it's something that's going to, quote unquote, you know, threaten national security or whatever their reasoning might be. I don't know that they have to even explain it super well. They can, you know, basically put the kibosh on someone's invention, someone's intellectual property and and, and essentially take it from them, you know, because they think it's a threat in some way to some form of this perception of national security or the greater good, you know. Yeah. Yeah. However, please don't mistake this as me saying I'm 100% on board with Rupert Sheldrake's work. I haven't read uh, a lot of his work. I don't know a ton of stuff about him. I think we have many, many things to discover about psilocybin for sure. And the human brain and how it, how it communicates what the hardware and the software is. Right. Uh, But like, here's an example to really make Sheldrake understandable, the concept of the morphic field. So if the morphic field exists and it works in the way that Sheldrake pictures it, then if you get up one Saturday and you want to do a crossword puzzle, the crossword puzzle will be easier later in the day because other people have been doing the crossword puzzle and their collective success is resonating through the morphic field. Like, that's an example of how this would work. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Totally. I mean, it, yes, that, the example makes sense, but it's a tough thing to wrap your head around, I guess, as in that could be true. Absolutely, Matt. And also just to, to piggyback on something that Ben says, I, I too have not really dived deep into this man's work. This was my first uh, encounter with him looking into this for this uh, listener mail response. And I'm fascinated. I think he has some very pithy things to say about what we literally just talked about, about the ability for, you know, scientists to explore things that maybe the uh, establishment of the scientific community would, you know, sort of stick their nose up at. So that that in and of itself is enough for me to want to dig deeper. But this is a really good kind of encapsulation of his whole philosophy. Um, And I think it jives a lot with what we were just talking about. He says, science believes animals and plants are all just unconscious automatons. The whole of nature is unconscious except for human beings. We're the only smart guys in the whole universe and somehow figured out how everything works. And that means through science, we can manipulate nature and improve products for corporations. It says, then Sheldrake pauses and says, Descartes believed the only kind of mind was the conscious mind. Then Freud reinvented the unconscious. Then Jung said it wasn't just a personal unconscious, but a collective unconscious. Morphic resonance shows us that our very souls are connected with those of others and bound up with the world around us. Existence of a soul. I know it sounds horrible that that's my first... (laughs) That's my first net pick. But I think you're right. That is that is a great quote. I, I want to also say, Anon, uh, thank you for, ha-ha, thank you for calling us. We have to mention the hundredth monkey effect. That's the idea that a uh, a new behavior can somehow appear to spread rapidly through unexplained means from a single group to every other related group once there's this kind of critical mass of cognizance or knowledge of a task. It's called the hundredth monkey thing because uh, of this study that was conducted in the fifties on Japanese monkeys. And they saw, (sighs) okay. So the, the idea is that there are these unrelated populations of the same kind of living thing. Right. And at some point, a few of them say, I'm just making up stuff here. At some point, a few of them learn to maybe wash food. Or maybe to hunt with tools, like to stab fish or something with a stick. And they teach this to other members of their group. And then eventually, for no discernible reason, a group of the same species, maybe across the country, across the world, suddenly appears to have that knowledge. How did it get there, right? It's a mystery. But I I think that would apply. That would be something uh, worth exploring for fans of morphic residents. I don't know. Have you guys heard of that? Hundred monkey theory. Yeah, no. we've talked. We talked about it on oh. on the show before. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, yes, yes, I've definitely heard of this. <laughs> um, 
yeah, and I think it was last year when we were talking about. No, that wasn't the stoned apes theory. There, we did one on magic mushrooms and the and Jesus. Uh, I cannot recall exactly when. Maybe somebody out there listening remembers. It also reminds me of the stoned ape theory that Terrence McKenna always talks about. Um, by the way, Terrence McKenna and uh, and Sheldrake were were pals. Um, Terrence McKenna, the kind of pioneering psychonaut, uh, the notion that you know it was the ape that ate the psychedelic mushroom that gave him more visual acuity and connection with his surroundings to become a better hunter um, and all of that stuff. So it, it does remind me of that. And to be clear, like morphic resonance, the concept of the hundredth monkey is not accepted in the ivory towers. It's not accepted in academia. It's not accepted by mainstream science. As a matter of fact, uh, the test that the urban legend was based off, the, the colony of monkeys there was only about 59, I think. So there actually was no physical hundredth monkey. But how cool would it be if it's true? <laughs> how cool would it be if there were? <laughs> oh, man. Well, hey, this has been a great, uh, great episode, guys. Thank you, everybody who wrote to us, who called in. This is this has been fabulous. I think it. Who was it? Schmidt? Yes, you're right, Matt. Thank you to Schmidt. Thank you to Jace. Thank you to Anonymous for calling in, for writing to us. Uh, as always, we can't wait to hear from you. Codename Doc Holiday pointed out that we may be getting uh, a lot more correspondence because this is a regular weekly segment. Uh, so please let us know. If you can prove morphic resonance, let us know. If you are familiar with with uh, secret Canadian military aircraft, let us know if you have disappeared completely and can somehow communicate the tale to us. We would love to hear it. That's right. You can reach out to us on Facebook if you wish. We've got a group there called Here's Where It Gets Crazy, where all you got to do to get in is name me or Ben or Matt or, or, or codename Doc Holiday, uh, Mission Control, anything that lets us know that you are aware of what the show is, and we will let you right on in where you can interact with your fellow listeners. Um, been getting some really positive feedback there about strange news, and I think maybe that can be another source for us to even pull some stuff from, because there's always some fun articles that people post and memes and all of that. Um, and I don't know, maybe we'll even post some, some polls or something there one of these days. We'll see. But it's a great place to be. Here's where it gets crazy. If you don't want to do that, you can hit us up on other social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, where we're Conspiracy Stuff and Conspiracy Stuff Show. Um, what else do we have, fellas? You can call us. Our number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. Leave a message. You might get on one of these episodes. We're going to hear it no matter what. We're excited to hear your voice and to hear what you have to say about this and any other topic, any suggestion, anything you want to discuss, call us and talk about it. Hey, and a heads up, if you are not already subscribed to our YouTube channel at Conspiracy Stuff, go ahead and make sure you head over there right now and subscribe. We're going to begin posting on that channel again, so prepare yourself and tell your friends Make sure they head that way, youtube.com slash conspiracy stuff. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, you want to just contact us the good old-fashioned way, why not send us an email? We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.